Okay, so for our opening word, we're going to turn to 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. If you are trying to figure out what is different about me, it is because I don't have my glasses. You're like, what? What's going to something? Is this brother in the spirit? <laughs> Something's off. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have my, uh, my glasses. I'm in the process of getting new glasses. And my, pres- you know, my prescription is not uh, bad, so I'm able to actually navigate without my glasses. Well, let's see, let's see if I can survive the night driving without my glasses. <laughs> no, I'll be fine. So 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 20. This is the word of the Lord. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are from special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made wholly useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let's stop right there, verse 22. We're not going to read verse 23. We're just going to stop at verse 22. I would like to give you all about a minute or so to reread those verses, those few verses there to yourself, and ask yourself over the next minute, what stands out to you in those verses? Verses 20. 21 and 22. We'll pick it up in a few minutes, in about a minute. Paul the Apostle here is writing one of his several pastoral epistles, his letters. This one specifically to another pastor friend, somebody who Paul himself was responsible for in the discipleship of his own faith, Timothy. Paul here is writing to Timothy. And in this pastoral letter, he invokes many metaphors, many pictures, if you will, to illustrate divine truths. And Paul is wise to follow his own master, Jesus Christ, who does an excellent job, the best ever, to use metaphors, similes, and parables to communicate divine and holy truths. The metaphor here, of course, is that of a house possessed with elements for use. Utensils. And he says here in verse 20, in a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. And some are for special Purposes and some are for common use. Okay, Paul, what's up with this metaphor? What's up with this image that you are giving to us? He now links it in verse 21 to the disposition of the human being. The disposition, the internal uh, fortitude of the human being. He says, those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. The question I believe the Holy Spirit will have us to reflect on today, before we get into the word in Revelation chapter 14, is this. Which kind of vessel are you? Are you a vessel of clay? A vessel of common use, you know, the kind of uh, plates used for a bowl of cereal, for a hot pocket you want to warm up and throw in a microwave? Or are you a different kind of vessel in the house of the Lord? 
You know, the special china, that special plate that your grandmother gave you that side eye if you even walked too close to it. The, the special towel that you ought not to use because it is embroidered and is only used for display, for aesthetics, not for the drying of your hands. What kind of vessel, what kind of utensil are you in the Lord's hand? The Lord has called each and every one of us to ministry. Ministry is not something we simply do. In other words, ministry is not something external to our identity. Ministry, rightly understood, flows naturally from our identity in Christ. Ministry flows naturally from our identity in Christ, which is why there's no such thing as full-time ministry or part-time ministry. In the final analysis, whether or not you are working in McDonald's or in the church, you are doing full-time ministry. The question is, do we have the right mind set? Are we coming to the job with the right paradigm to recognize that the Lord has called us to be faithful to him in whatever given context he has placed us in? Whether I find myself as a student or a teacher, both are areas of contexts that I have the capacity to engage in service to others in ministry. And not only, not only is ministry something that ought to stream out of our identity in Christ, we want to sit and really pray about and think about, Lord, is the ministry that I am engaged in day in and day out honorable to you? When I study for exams or when I'm giving exams as a, as a uh, teacher or professor, Lord, am I doing this prayerfully? As I find myself retired or someone ready for full-time work, Lord, what are you calling me to do in this particular station in my life? Am I to be a utensil, an instrument in your hand for common use? Now, praise be to God for the any, kind of, any kind of usefulness we find ourselves uh, in the hand of the Lord, right? But we ought to have the desire for that special kind of use so that we can be kingdom builders for the sake of Christ. Amen? And Paul says here, in light of the vessels found in a home, we can find ourselves either in the nice china closet being used on special occasions or the everyday use. How? Take a look at verse 22. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee the evil desires of youth. Other translations say the lustful desires. The lustful desires. We are saints. We are sanctified. We are holy. How? Not because of the ministries we are involved in. Not because of the church or churches we attend. Neither is our sanctity dependent on the amount of times we come to church. We are saints, we are sanctified only because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that righteousness is imputed onto us out of sheer grace. We receive that grace, we receive that sanctity through faith. Faith itself is also a gift. And so, the question then is, if the holiness that is of God is given to us as a gift, 
Am I living out of that holiness? In other words, am I living out of my true identity as a believer? Am I living out of faith? Am I living out of joy, the joy of the Spirit? Or do I find myself grumbling nine out of ten times? Am I working patience? Am I exercising the righteousness that comes by way of the efficacious work of the Holy Spirit in and through my life? Am I being wise and gentle and forgiving? Am I being humble? Am I practicing meekness? The only way we gain these virtues, sisters and brothers, is through faith in Christ, receiving the ministering presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? God is good. God is great. But we only get this through faith. But we have to ask ourselves again, are we living out of our true identity? You guys know I'm big on identity. We have to stop and ask ourselves, are we living out of the faith? Or is the faith something external to us? Is the faith, our faith as believers, internal and at the center of who we are? Or is it somehow external and a kind of addendum to our life, an appendage we sometimes recognize that is a part of us, not at the core of who we are? In other words, is our faith a mask or is it our true self? I'll say that again. Is our faith a mask or is it our true self? Now, of course, no one in this room, no one in this church, no one in this world is perfect, right? We all sin. Should we sin? No. Do we receive grace? Yes. Can we then go about sinning so that grace may abound? No. Romans chapter 6, chapter 7. So then what do we do when we find ourselves sinning? We stop. We turn back to Christ. We repent. And we hold up the cross against the devil and his lies. We reckon our flesh crucified onto Christ. We see our old self dead and buried with Jesus, that we may live out of the peace and power of the resurrection. Amen? These are lofty words. These are holy words. But the only way we actually engage this is through prayer, through repentance, remaining humble, Remembering who we really are. Yes? Thoughts? The question is, what word stands out to us in this passage? What did the Holy Spirit say to you specifically as you read these verses? For me, one of the words that came out was the word master and the word utensil. Honorable use. Another phrase that came to me. The first word in verse 22, flee youthful lusts. Flee. That word flee, run. And every time I see a word like that, it reminds me of the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Run. Don't sit and debate. Don't warm your hands in the enemy's fire camp like Peter did and ending up blaspheming and denying the Lord three times? Run. Sometimes we don't run. Amen? Sometimes we find ourselves caught. When that happens, rather than running from Christ out of guilt and shame, run to Jesus. Amen? Run to Jesus. With that said, let's open up with a word of prayer and then we'll move into Revelation chapter 14. Father, we thank you that 
The gospel is an amazing gift to us. The power onto salvation. We thank you, Lord, that you have freed us from sin, from sickness, from brokenness. Lord, we also recognize that we live between the times. We live in tension. We live between the kingdom being here, but not fully here. And so we strive forward. We march as soldiers of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, reorient our minds and our hearts that we may be rooted in you. Forgive us, Lord, for our hypocrisy, for our duplicity, for our fakeness. Grant us the strength to be authentic, to be true to ourselves, that we may be indeed true to you. We cannot do this, Lord. And so we praise you, Father, because you are good, holy, and righteous, and that you would share that holiness with us. We give you thanks, Lord. We thank you for your continued faithfulness. We thank you for the light that is the lamp onto our feet, a light onto our path. We thank you that you are our rock and our shield. We thank you that you are our strong tower, our fortress in whom we can run into. We thank you, Lord, that you are the lion of the tribe of Judah whose roar shatters the powers of the enemy. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, that we can be called Christians. We thank you for the blood shed on the cross. It is by that blood we are able to stand in you. Father, help us to pray for one another, to love each other. It's in your name. Amen. 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 So, so turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. We are here moving through this amazing work filled with, again, metaphor, simile, prophetic imagery about the eschaton, one of those fancy theological words saying the end of the age. It's here in this book we see how Christ and his kingdom is finally established on this world in a visceral way, in a visible way, in a tangible way. It is here in Revelation we see the struggle and the fight of the saints of God against the persecution that is always in contradistinction to the ways of the Lord. We see blood flowing in Revelation. We see the faithfulness of God despite the brokenness and the atrocities. We see the judgments of God being poured out on a sin, sick, depraved world. And we see, and we'll see particularly in chapter 14, that that judgment which is being poured out is in fact also couched or anchored in another possibility for repentance. We're actually going to see this in the several angels that come out and declare the gospel again to all the tribes, the people, and the nations. Here in chapter 14 of Revelation, we started last week before we ended the first several verses. And one of the major numbers here in chapter 14 is 144,000 which for biblical uh, scholars and commentaries will say it here, this number represents those who remain faithful unto God. Faithful unto God in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of tribulation. The 144,000 people here 
is one of the prophetic, the Jewish prophetic images speaking of those who remain true, who remain faithful unto God in the very presence of persecution and suffering. And that faithfulness here in chapter 14 is beautifully uh, uh, juxtaposed with the unfaithfulness found in chapter 13. The people who are the world who is co-opted by the persuasive and efficacious power of the dragon, the beast from the sea, and the beast from the land, from the earth. Those people, bless you, those people who bow their knee to the image, who are wooed by the satanic powers, those people are found wanting. The folks that we see in chapter 13, which we came through, are those who bow their knee to the false, who turn their back to the truth, who run from God so that they may pursue their fleshly delights. And it's those folks that we see in chapter 13, which really makes up the vast majority of the world in this context, uh, is uh, excuse me, is compared beautifully with the folks in chapter 14 that are faithful, the 144,000. So let's look at this. Verse 1, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. 144,000. Again, the symbolic representation of those who remain faithful. They possess whose name on their foreheads? God's name. It's the Father's name. And who else? God the Son's name. The Lamb's name. In their forehead. What does the forehead represent? What do you think the forehead here symbolizes? Wonderful. Thought. What else does the fore forehead represent? Yes. Phylactery. Yeah. Yeah. To inscribe, to inscribe the law, right, on the forehead, on the doorposts, on your arm, right? You see this in, in certain Jewish practices? Okay, and you see here this metaphor running with it that the name of God, the triune God, is placed. Where? The forehead. Where else do people receive a mark on their forehead? In chapter 13. That's right, the hand, of course. The 666, the mark of the beast. Let's continue to read here. And, verse 2. I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. Imagine that. A thunderous sound of harp. And they sang a new song. Uh-oh. Here we go. As we mentioned in our closing time last week, we are now rushing back to a theology of worship. Worship. Repeat with me. Worship. We don't have a choice, sisters and brothers, but to worship. As human beings, we are worship-oriented creatures. The question is not whether we worship. The question is who we worship or what we worship. Let me, let me, let me elaborate this a little bit more. This, that sounds like a little crazy, right? So to be human, to be human, though it seems like the way God has made us as image bearers of God, right? Imago Dei in Latin, the image of God, the likeness of God, Genesis, right? We seem to be, I'm going to give you a new word. I've, I've probably mentioned this before a couple of times uh, in Through the Word over the past two years or whatnot. We are, check this out, exocentric 
beings. It's a weird word, right? Exocentric. For those of you who want to write that down, I'll spell it for you. E-X-O. C-E-N-T-R-I-C. Exocentric beings. It's a compound word, right? Made up of two words. Exo meaning external, outside. Centric meaning what? Center, within. The human creature is a creature that longs for, that yearns for a center. And the creature that is the human being that longs for a center, we tend to look for that center outside of ourselves. Whether you want to devote yourself to an ideal or to the life of pleasure, the human being is inescapably exocentric. We are worshiping creatures. Which means that if we know not, if we do not know the true God, the living God, Yahweh, the Holy Trinity, we will be automatically idol worship creatures. We will construct a God onto our own image and likeness. We will exalt something and say, that is what my life is about. If it's not God, we'll do it with something else. Even the atheist who says there is no God worships a God. In other words, the human being cannot but speak religious language. Our mother tongue, our mother tongue, our native language as a species is religious language. We always speak of things of ultimate concern to us, right? Okay, that being said, we are worshiping creatures. Now, if we don't know God, as I said, we'll tend to worship something else. We'll tend to, in other words, place our significance, our worth on something or someone else. I'll say that again. We will, if we, know, if we don't know God, we will tend to place our significance and our worth on something other than God. That means to worship, to worship, right, is who we are. We are worshiping creatures. Who are we worshiping? And a theology of worship and a right understanding of worship is this. In worshiping God, the true God, we come to our true self. That's the essence of it. In worshiping the true God, we come to our true self. We discover who we are. We discover that we are loved. We are reminded that we are blessed. We are reminded who our Heavenly Father is. Amen? Amen? It's in worshiping we come to know the beautiful vision of Jesus Christ. We come to intimate awareness of the Holy Spirit. Worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus in the Gospel of John. Spirit and the truth. And that's the center of worship. There's a reason why we are drawn to glory, to praise, and to adoration. But we want to we continue to meditate on this and think about what is this really about? Josh, I wasn't sure if you had a hand up. It looked like you... Okay, yeah, go ahead. Isn't God, isn't God external? Isn't that something that we're doing that we don't... Is God external to us? That's what you're asking? Like Yes. So God yeah. would be considered one of those external 
Right, and God is, God is the only one that actually satiates or satisfies our worshipful desire. What's amazing about that, Josh, is this, that God, as God, being God, not only is external to us, but is also what? Internal. Internal. You know how Paul says he fills all things? Like there's a lot of this language over and again that God fills all the spaces. He fills all things with his glory, with his grace. Yeah. We are joined to the Lord, one spirit. One spirit joined to the Lord. One spirit joined to the Lord, absolutely. Which speaks of an ecclesiology, or in other words, a theology of the church. That we are all joined together. That's amazing when you think about that, that we worship a God who is infinitely above us. Yet, whose very word sustains us infinitely within. And through salvation, takes up residence within our very heart. I mean, just, just, just get that vision. That's crazy. I find that utterly beautiful. Give me one second. I find that utterly amazing. That God is simultaneously transcendent, yet eminent. He is a God that cannot be grasped or comprehended. A God who infinitely transcends all. Who cannot be merely collapsed into some kind of manipulative grasp. But yet this God, through his love, his condescensive intimacy, takes up residence within our hearts. It's amazing. Then you think that's, like, that is that, that's it? Then God, not only being infinitely above us and infinitely within us, walks side by side with us as companion, as lover, as friend, as father, as teacher, as counselor, as rebuker at times, and discipler. But let's, let's go a little further in the scripture here, because we are seen with the scene of the harps, or the harpists and the thundering sound coming from heaven. So verse 3, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. How many of us Sing. Sing, sing. Oh, right, that, that. Sing, sing, like just sing. How many of us, not professionally, right? Singing is a, yo. Singing in the shower. <laughs> when we engage, sisters and brothers, when we engage in the arts, we are so beautifully imaging our Father in heaven, who is the artist, who is the creator. There are many ways of singing, of course. You can paint. You could be painting or sketching, and that being, in a sense, a form of worship unto God. But here I'm thinking of singing itself. I don't personally sing often enough. Enough. I don't sing. I don't, I don't sing often enough. I don't. I would like to do it more. I, you know, I'm singing. I'm worshiping the Lord on Sundays. But there are moments in my, in my home where I sense the Spirit of God pulling me away to worship Him. Amen? Have you ever had that experience? Of just like, man, I just want to turn to the Lord right now and pour out my heart. And just extol the beauty and the virtues of the Lord. So I want to give to the Lord my heart. I want to give to the Lord my mind. I want to give to Him my emotions. I want to sing a new song. I want to sing a song of praise. I want to sing a song of adoration, of worship. I want to write unto the Lord. I want to do a little poetry for the Lord. Amen? That is so amazingly freeing. When we learn to worship the Lord unhindered, 
when we let ourselves loose recklessly onto the Lord, where we're not ashamed of tears streaming down the face or hands, holy hands lifted up onto the Lord, as Paul writes in Timothy, not being ashamed of that, when men are not ashamed of weeping before other men and, we and other women because of the beauty of the Lord, where women are not ashamed because of their boisterous nature onto the Lord, that's a beautiful thing. That's a godly thing. And it's in that wild, untamed worship onto the Lord we find a new voice. We find a new song within us. We begin to experience a new shaking within our spirit. A new alteration within the tenor of our soul. Because God is so beautiful. God is so beautiful. When we are confronted with beauty, sisters and brothers, we adore. That's what beauty does. Beauty captures us, does it not? Let's get earthy for a second. Let's get earthy, right? Like when, when beauty, like you watch a sunrise, it, you, you have to, you have to, especially, especially when it's strikingly beautiful, you have to stop and just gaze, right? I almost caused three accidents doing that. Actually, I was driving here <laughs> today. Uh, and, and, and just the way the sun, the, the light was streaming through the clouds a few hours ago. I don't know if anybody saw that. You saw the, I was driving, and I'm on the highway, bro. Bro, I was on the highway. I was like this, and I was like, oh, snap. But what's interesting is how beauty, how beauty wants to steal gazes from you. You're like, oh, my God, look at that. You risk your life to adore the beautiful. And, and, and that's... Listen, that's a sun. That's a sun, couple of, you know, how, as, as beautiful as the light streaming through the clouds is, and it is indeed beautiful, we are right now talking about the one who is the architect and the engineer of that beauty, God himself, who is beauty, who is love. Who is power? Who is glory? What else can you do when you are in the presence of the Lord but worship him? In fact, the Lord has to, as he did with the prophets of old, when just an angel showed up, the Lord has to strengthen you. So you can, you, can, you can be raised from the ground and now enter into discourse with the Lord. You know that? When you're hit with the vision of the Lord, you, you, ha you have to praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? That is, listen, I pray that we all become amazingly possessed by that beauty that is God. We're just gripped by the beauty of God. We're just gripped by the presence of God. We're just gripped so we can be compelled to be God, check this out, God pleasers. Not self pleasers, but God pleasers. We're gripped by the vision of God, the beauty of God. It's like, I don't, it's not about me. It's not about me. It was never about me. It's all about the Lord. It's all about the, may the Lord Hide me behind his cross. May the Lord hide me under the shadows of his wings. Let everything I do be a pointer unto the glory of God. Let all my speech be as if I am speaking the very oracles of God. Let no unclean speech be on your lips. No foul or coarse joking be on your lips. Let your eye gate or your vision always perceive the good, the true, the beautiful, the holy. 
And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, verse 3. No one could learn the song except the 144,000. Again, those who persevered. The believers who stood strong in the presence of persecution, in the presence of temptation, in the presence of doubt, in the presence of fear, who had been, beautiful word, look at this, redeemed from the earth. Redeemed from the earth. What I love about X-Men, the movie, and the comic book. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Somebody like, stop. Oh, I just woke up right now. This is about X-Men. <laughs> so let me sit down. Let me sit up for a second. <sighs> you know, X-Men. For those of you who, who, who are not aware of X-Men, X-Women, <laughs> comic books, just bear with me, right? Now, now, comic books, or what they call these days graphic novels, it's not a comic book, it's a graphic novel, right? Usually, they, they possess amazing philosophical, sociopolitical uh, uh, narratives. There's a, lot, there's a lot of depth there, right? And really, the whole X-Men genre is a recasting of, of many of the themes that you and I have experienced just as human beings, um, discrimination, forms of racism, oppression, and various methods to rectify the problem. You have Magneto, who is really a recasting of using the civil rights movement. He is a really a recasting of Malcolm X methodology by any means necessary. By any means necessary. They are inferior anyway. Listen, we got to do our stuff. And then you have Xavier, right? The bald guy in the wheelchair, for those of you who yeah. so, Who is a recasting of Martin Luther King Jr., right? Who's all about, we, we got to come together. We just got to love. Listen, mutants and non-mutants, we got to find reconciliation. We got to do this. We got to come together. What's amazing about that methodology put forth by Xavier in the X-Men narrative is that Xavier... The, the good guy in this sense, the good guy. Though Magneto is not necessarily a bad guy, he just has a different method, but we'll leave that in the side for a second. Is that Xavier wants to redeem. He wants people to experience redemption through reconciliation. We ought not need to, we don't need to be afraid of one another. We can come together and help each other out. That's going to require learning. That's going to require compassion. That's going to require forgiveness. But we can do this, right? Redemption, redemption presupposes forgiveness. Redemption assumes the inner work of forgiveness. The reason why the Lord was able to redeem us is because the Lord purposed in his own heart from eternity to forgive us. The Lord forgives. The Lord's desire is reconciliation. So that there is a new man. Amen? A new man. Ephesians. One new humanity. That's what that phrase means. A new man. One new humanity. And they are singing in heaven about this level of redemption. This level of forgiveness. This unbelievable breakthrough from God. That the Lord would come down and sweep us up in his eternal embrace. So this is, look what it says here in verse 4 now. Using metaphoric language. These are those who did not defile themselves with women. For they remained virgins. They followed the Lamb and wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. Verse 5, no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. For those of you who are taking notes, I would like to break down chapter 14 for you. 
Uh, verses 1 through 5. If you want to write verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5 speak of the vindication of the saints. The vindication of the saints. What we're reading right now, actually. Verses 1 through 5. Vindication of the saints. From verses 6 through 13. 6 through 13. You have what is the final message of salvation. And judgment. We're going to read that in just a moment. The final message of salvation and judgment to the nations. And wait a minute, we're not done. Verses 14 to 16. Check this out. <laughs> Verses 14 to 16. You have the harvest of the saints. Think of, think of uh, farming here. The harvest of the saints. Verses 14 through 16, the harvest of the saints. And verses 17 to 20, the harvest of the sinners. Now, back to verse 4. You have this metaphor here of, for instance, as these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. What this uh, 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 signifies is Christians maintaining their spiritual purity. Christians maintaining their spiritual purity in an adulterous generation. Think of the language of Jesus, a wicked and adulterous generation. I'm gonna, I want to say a little bit about the spiritual purity part in just a moment, right? But it's here signifying Christians maintaining their spiritual pure, purity. The word here, virgins, illustrates the purity of believers. Undefiled, kept unblemished, virgins, signifies Christians maintaining their spiritual purity. In this historical context, this meant believers, true believers, will not engage in pagan worship. They won't bow a knee to the false idols. They won't bow a knee to the image. They won't receive the mark in their hand or in their forehead. They will remain pure. A real believer doesn't engage in what is called syncretism. Repeat with me, syncretism. You know, you, know, you, start, you start dabbling in different religious practices. You start importing certain religious traditions into your own discipleship. You start flirting with what Paul calls in 1 Timothy or I think it's the second Timothy actually, the doctrine of demons, certain contexts, Christians won't succumb to the societal pressures around them. They will remain pure unto the Lord. They will remain pure. Now we have to be careful with this because purity here for the believer doesn't mean locking oneself up in the church and never going out into the world. That's Phariseeism. That's being a Pharisee. That's being a religious zealot. That's not remaining pure. That's one of the quickest ways of, of becoming un, impure, actually. Like, I'm only going to be hanging with Christians. I'm going to just stay in the church. I'm never going to interact with the world. Yeah? Right? That's, that's not Christianity. That's not Christianity. That's not what it means to follow Jesus. That's not what it means to follow the apostles. Who did not mind getting dirty for the sake of the salvation of others. Christ went to the sinners. Christ interacted with the sinners. Now, you and I may not see that as like, you know, we got, we got to really put ourselves in that historical context to understand the gravitas of that. Jesus touched the dead. 
Jesus also touched the leopards, both of which, according to the Mosaic law, would have rendered Jesus defiled. Jesus had one-on-one -on -one interactions with women. Women in Second Temple Judaism, you've got to understand the place of women during that era, second-class citizens. And it would have been very scandalous for a Jewish man to talk to a woman that is not his wife in public with nobody else there for accountability. To make the matter worse, we see in the Gospel of John, Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. Jews saw the Samaritans, the Samaritans saw the Jews, the way you and I may see somebody from the LGBTQ community, or the way you may see somebody from ISIS. Somebody so outside of the grace of God, how evangelical Christians sometimes see, right? By the way, it's quite interesting to note that Paul the Apostle was ISIS. Paul the Apostle was a terrorist. But let's just leave that there for a side. It says something about how we ought to pray. The mission of Christ is to get into the dirt of the world so as to clean the world. That's it to get into the dirt of the world so as to clean the world. He gets infinitely close, scandalously close, so that Jesus' holiness and cleansingness spills over to the dirt and cleanses the dirt. That is love. That is holiness. Then I saw another angel, thank you, flying in midair and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth to every nation tribe language and people he said in a loud voice fear god and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come worship him who made the heavens the earth the sea and the springs of water the gospel turn to god and worship him this is happening, this is happening in the midst of tribulation, persecution, right before God is about to harvest the saints and the sinners. What happens? One more time. He says an angel to Now there are many interpretations about this particular passage. The question is, is this a literal angel that God ushers uh, uh, sends that's circling the earth now and is proclaiming the gospel in a supernatural way? Or is this angelic proclamation of the gospel a metaphor of the gospel still going out even when Christians are being persecuted? That's something I'll, I'll, I'll leave for your own study and further investigation. The point, however, is this, that the gospel goes out. Amen? Even when you are hated, proclaim the gospel. That's the message for us, the pastoral message. Even when people ignore you, don't forsake Jesus. Show them love anyway. Forgive them anyway. Somebody forces you to walk one mile, walk with them two miles anyway. Give me a coat. I'll also give you my scarf. Let's do this. Let's walk. Let's love. Not easy. We need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. We are New Yorkers. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to love those who are persecuting us, to seek the good of those who hate us, to pray for those who despitefully use us, but there's no way around the words of Christ. This is the mark of a kingdom people. Not how many scriptures you can quote. Not how many ministries you are involved in. 
Not how many Christian fishes you have in the back of your car. Not how many crosses you wear. Whether or not you are a pastor. None of that in the final analysis matters. None of that is indicative of who you are in Christ. The measure of a Christian is the measure of love. The measure of a Christian is a measure of love. And let us not tell ourselves how much we love God whom we do not see and not love our sisters and brothers whom we do see. First John. Let us not deceive ourselves. Amen? Which leads us to, after the proclamation of the gospel, verse 8, a second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. The word Babylon here references, right? Babylon was what back in the day? Ancient, ancient civilization, correct? Ancient city, Babylon. The word Babylon here is the metaphoric world to describe the demonic kingdom, the fallen world, or what Paul usually just calls the world, right? The worldly system or the fallen world. Earthly only in as far, Josh, as it is located on earth, but not in the same way we would think of, a, of an actual government, right? So, for instance, when the, the word world is used multiple, in multiple different ways in the scriptures, you have, let's say, the, the very famous scripture that we know, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, right? For God so loved the world, in that context, the word world signifies or equals people, humanity. But then you have in other scriptures, do not love the world. For if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That world, in that context, signifies the worldly system. Do not be conformed to this world or to the world, the worldly system, the, the world of the flesh, in other words of lusting after power, lusting after worldly ambition, things like that. And so what we, hear, what we see here with the first two angels is, number one, angel one is the proclamation of the gospel. Then you have another angel saying, listen, know what the world is. Know what the world is. And that world is, in fact, fallen. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. And then you have the third angel here. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beasts and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur, in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. That's hardcore. Judgment is real, sisters and brothers. Let no one fool you. As I said before many times in this book, if you believe in justice, you believe in judgment. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Let us use this scripture to speak of more earthly things rather than the eternal torment of sinners. Those who worship anything that is not of God will not experience rest in this world. St. Augustine says, My heart was restless until it found rest in thee, O Lord. Book of Confessions. My heart was restless until it, find, it found rest in thee, O Lord. When we do not worship the Lord, when we do not know the Lord, when we do not return to the Lord, what we are left with is, sisters and brothers, restlessness, anxiety, weariness, confusion. Anybody been there before? I've been there many times. 
I remember living life. I remember living life before I came to Christ. I remember my life. I remember it being a restless existence. I remember experiencing psychological and spiritual torment, not knowing Christ. I remember smoke surrounding my capacity to perceive reality. I remember it all. I did not have rest. I did not have joy. Did I have moments of pleasure? Absolutely. Did I have moments of high or adulation? Absolutely. And even in my fallenness, even in my infinite distance from the Lord, the, the Lord still allowed sun to shine on me as he, as he allows sun to shine on the righteous. And the Lord, even though I was infinitely far from the Lord in that time of my life, from my own mind, the Lord always there drawing me, the Lord sent rain as he sends rain both on the wicked and the righteous. But I remember in my heart of hearts not having peace. And then I remember the summer of 2003 when the Lord arrested me and I came to know his peace and I came to know of his presence and I came to know of his goodness and I was hit with the beauty of the Lord. And when you get hit with the beauty of the Lord, when you don't know the Lord, it's kind of like simultaneously getting hit with a Mack, Mack truck and, and like a sunbeam all at the same time coming through the clouds, just like that. Wrecked, wrecked. Like, I don't know, mom behind from my elbow. I don't know what's up or down. I didn't know. I just knew that I knew who the Lord is now. You know? How many of you know what I'm saying? I mean, God is, wow. God is wow. That's a nice title for a book. God is wow. And so verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Remain faithful faithful to Jesus. Remain faithful to Yeshua. Remain faithful to Christ. Remain faithful to Jesus. Remain faithful to Jesus. And then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. It would be wrong for me to say there will come a day when perhaps one day we'll be facing a barrel, a gun before us, and we have to make a decision. It would be wrong because it would be somewhat Western-centric because we have sisters and brothers experiencing that right now all around the world. Christians who are forced to make a decision. Deny your faith and live. Don't deny your faith. You want to remain faithful to Christ? I will kill you. In fact, I'll probably begin to kill your family and I'll allow you to watch that and then I'll kill you. It's a hard word. It's not the kind of word we want to hear in church. That's a reality for many of our sisters and brothers. Remain faithful to Christ. Remain faithful to Christ. That person calls you over late night, you know what that's about. Remain faithful to Christ. Your coworker invites you into this scheme that you know in the final analysis is just another form of cheating. Remain faithful to Christ. You have an opportunity to get quick cash. It's not of God. Remain faithful to Christ. Go out with the guys. Go out with the ladies. Have a couple of drinks by which you know it won't be just a couple of drinks because you struggle in that area. Remain faithful to Christ. Know your limits. Know who you are. Know the God you serve. And know that even if you fall, God is gracious. But in his grace, 
He'll slap you up a little bit so you can grow. Allowing sometimes the consequences of sin to sting you, even though the sin has been forgiven. Yes, says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Let's wrap up chapter 14 here. Verse 14, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, the great harvest. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the clouds swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. All of this is metaphorical language. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The grapes here is a metaphor of the sinners, the broken, those who eternally say no to God. The angel swung his sickle on the earth and gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city and blood flowed out of the press rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia which is roughly, I'm looking here in the margins of this Bible, about 180 miles. That's hardcore. 180 miles of a river of blood as high as the horse's brittle. God is in control, and God is just. Sometimes we struggle with the justice of God, right? I know I have. God, if you're all loving and forgiving, why are you judging these people? As believers, we are admonished to do two things. Love the Lord our God with all of our minds. In loving the Lord our God with all of our minds, we should study, we should read, we should answer, or excuse me, we should ask the questions that we have and search for answers. Amen? We should not take questions and stuff them into our soul that breed into doubts and then give birth to despair and faithlessness. Pursue the questions you have theological questions, biblical questions, apologetical questions. That's number one. Love the God with all of your mind. Love God with all of your mind. Number two, trust in the Lord. We may not see how God will work out all the details, but yet we can trust that God is perfectly just. Remember, this is the God whom Abraham talked to, Lord, if there is 50 righteous people in that city, would you save the city? Would you spare those 50? I was like, yeah, I, I, you know, I got them. Okay, if there were 25 righteous people, do you remember that narrative? I want to read Genesis. If there, if, there, if there are 10 people, would you? I was like, yes, I, I, I got those people. I won't allow this to fall on them. The final wrath will not fall on them. So we don't know the details as to how God is going to sift the righteous from the wicked. All we are given is metaphorical language of sickles and clouds and speaking of how, not how God will do it, but that God will in fact do it. Amen? 
God is just. But it is this justice that should compel you and I to check this out. I'm going to close with this word. That should compel us. It should compel us to sow our prayers with tears. Sow our prayers with tears. Pray for revival. Pray for revival. Pray for revival. Pray for an awakening. When the great awakenings happened in the United States, do you know what took place? And what's amazing is that every time a great awakening happened, whether it was Charles Finney, uh, 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 some others, I can't recall the names right now, all, even, even John Wesley over, over the Atlantic, every time a great revival took place, Years right after that, massive bloodshed and war took place. After the second great uh, arrival, excuse me, a great awakening, after, right after the second great awakening, World War I took place. Right after the first great awakening, revivals I'm referring to here, guys, for those of you who want to do a little research, check that out. The Civil War, the Civil War took place in America. I'm not talking about Captain America here. I don't know why. I do know this, that the Spirit of God, who is Lord over all of time, knows the beginning from the end. And he knows when revival needs to happen because something's about to come down. That's all I do know. But we need to pray for revival. When revival took place in the church, bars had to close down. Did you know that? They fired. They had to fire... <laughs> Crime went down. Did you know that there was what is called the businessmen revival that happened, started in Manhattan? Did you know that? Go home or, or make a note to yourself and you know. Look up and Google the businessman revival that began in the city. A revival breaking out in Wall Street. Now we, it, <laughs> we can't, we, we're like, why the revival? What's, what's happening there? And it was called the businessman revival to the point where at noon, every workday, there were prayer rooms all over Manhattan, and that spilled over across America, and it spilled even over the Atlantic into the Welsh revival. Yeah. The, listen, we have to pray for an awakening. This is no joke. I know Game of Thrones is fun to watch. I know, I know we enjoy our entertainment once in a while. There's a time to play, and there's a time to do some serious business. Amen? Yeah. Sacrifice a Friday night. Sacrifice a Saturday night. Spend six hours on your knees. Get a jug of water. Let's do all-night vigils. Let's pray. Because this is not going to happen. By teaching over and over again, it's not going to happen by having nice theological conversations in a coffee shop. We need the Lord. And the waywardness of our culture is actually a reflection of the, the sleepiness of the church. You know, we are easily co-opted by, by the ways of this world. Because we don't, want, we don't want to be persecuted. We don't want, you know, but we have to be able to put our necks out there. Amen? Let's pray for revival. Let's pray for an awakening. Let's, let's, let's do this. Let's stop talking about it. Let's be about it. Amen? Look up the, the businessman revival. Look up uh, the first great awakening, the second great awakening. The first great awakening, you know what came out of that? I mean, I could be here. I, I could do a three-hour teaching just on the awakenings. How many of you heard of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Dartmouth, all the Ivy League schools? came out of the Great Awakening. No exaggeration. Look up the history. All within like a 50-year span too. When, when revival was breaking out. Rochester, New York, where I was this past... I know I'm, I'm over a little over time, I'm sorry. Rochester, New York, where I was this past week, and I have family up in Rochester. And they live um, in around the Quay, different areas. In the inner city of Rochester has one of the highest homicide rates in America. 
one of the highest homicide rates in America. The crime in Rochester, in the inner city of Rochester, is so hood that cops know their limits. They're just like, nah. After a certain time, they don't even know. RPD, which is called Rochester Police Department, they're like, no, we're not about that life. Did you know that Rochester was, I think, the, the home of the Second Great Awakening with Charles Finney and others? Interestingly enough, because the devil is a liar, it is also near Rochester where the Mormon religion started. Joseph Smith. Remember we're reading in Revelation how the devil mocks the work of God? He tries to copy and then like does his counterfeit? Look this up, guys. We have like computers in our hands. <laughs> Look this up. Amen? Okay, let's close out with prayer. Father, we repent, asking for forgiveness for our waywardness, our sleepiness, our laziness, our lethargy, our slothfulness. Father, we offer our minds and our souls to you. We ask that you would awaken us, start with us, Holy Lord. Awaken us to the beauty that you are, the vision that is you, O oh God. Keep us from sin. Give us a hunger for the things of God. Fire us up that we may love unabashedly. That we may really love so that we don't hold on to our lives. We're quick to give our lives over to the service of the kingdom. Help us to be like your servant Paul and Peter and John and James who was beheaded. Help us to be like the great women and men of God of old who forsook all things and gave it up to you and sought you, Lord, with a singleness of mind and heart. It's not about titles. It's not about position. It's not about material wealth or other acquisitions. It's about you, Lord. It's not about who's in or out. It's about you, Lord. Let us be a people who desire to see a mighty move of your spirit in our generation. No counterfeit stuff. The real deal. Give us hearts for you, Lord. Give us worshipful hearts. Loose our tongues that we may confess you daily, night and day, and that we may offer you the fruit of our lips, Lord. We wait for you. We love you. We seek you, Lord. Speak to us this week concerning this word. Remind us tomorrow morning as we arise. If it is tomorrow, you give us. Grant us rest this evening, Lord. Father, I ask that you would raise up prayer warriors even here. Awaken us to three, four in the morning that we may pray. Give us a heart for all night vigils. Give us a heart for fasting and for study of your word on our knees with tears. We are hopeful. We know you are already moving, Lord. And we thank you. We bless you. We glorify you. It's in the name of Christ. We pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. Love you guys. Have a wonderful evening. Get home safe. 
I'll see you all next week. God bless.